The results I'm going to be presenting in this talk are really three different ideas or related ideas stuck together in a single experiment. So the first part is about using the degenerate mode groups of a multi-mode fiber as separate modal channels. The second part is about modally decomposing a beam using a spatial light modulator. And the third part presents a new kind of modal DMUX, which uses one shared phase mask per polarization for all the modal channels. So as you may know, modes in an infinitely parabolic graded index multimode fiber form degenerate mode groups, are organized into columns here. So all modes within the same column, the same mode group, have the same propagation constant and propagation delay. So whereas in a step index fiber, you might have an LP12 mode like this, has odd and even forms with degenerate propagation constants. And if you launch into either one of those, you don't know what superposition of those two you're going to get at the receiver. In a graded index fiber, there's an additional degeneracy whereby the LP12 is also degenerate with the LP31. So if you launch into any one of these four modes, you don't know what superposition of those four modes you're going to get arriving at the receiver. Here I've got the propagation constants for a step index and graded index fiber, both 50 micron core, both with the same refractive index contrast. And you can see that in the step index fiber, the propagation constants follow more or less a straight line, whereas in the graded index fiber, the modes sort of clump together to form those mode groups where many modes share the same propagation constant, but they're separated from the other mode groups by relatively large delta betas. So whereas in the step index fiber, the mode can couple from one mode to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, in a kind of random walk fashion, doing only small propagation constant jumps each time, the graded index fiber tends to form islands of coupling, where the modes couple very strongly within a group, but maintains you know, some isolation from the other mode groups due to the relatively large spacings in their propagation constants. Now the largest mode group grows with the square root of n, with where n is the total number of modes. So if you can keep the modes relatively isolated within their own mode group or maybe some adjacent mode groups, it might be possible to avoid doing full n by n MIMO in a similar fashion to the ECOC post deadline from last year with the alcatel lucent france group used MIMO just to recover the polarization and degenerate modes rather than the full n by n. And as the propagation delays of modes within a mode group are also virtually identical, that also means less taps. However, I'm actually not going to be using any DSP in this experiment. Typically, if you had an LP11 mode, for example, coming at you at the receiver, some random orientation, you'd demux it like this. You'd have a beam splitter projected onto the basis of the two orthogonal LP11 modes and use DSP to recover the channel. However, it's also possible to just rotate the phase mask to line up with the incoming mode. And then you avoid the beam splitter and the DSP. So now the beam splitter loss scales with the number of channels rather than the number of basis modes, which obviously isn't of any use if your number of channels equals your number of basis modes, but is useful if you're spreading your modes out in mode space. Of course, to rotate that phase mask appropriately, you need to know the amplitude and phase of the incoming modes. Uh, luckily, you can measure that using an SLM. So for instance, here we've got a distribution of modes arriving at the receiver. It's a superposition of LP12 and LP31 modes Using the SLM, you can display a phase mask for each one of those constituent modes to measure its amplitude. And then you can interfere those modes to measure their relative phase. Looking at it a different way, here we've got the complex plane for each one of the four constituent modes can display the phase mask for each mode to measure its amplitude, i.e. the length of the vector. And then you can interfere them to find their relative phase, i.e. the orientation of the vector. So now you can measure the amplitude and phase of each constituent mode. 
So if you launch each mode one at a time into the fiber and measure the distribution of modes arriving at the receiver, it's possible to measure the full modal coupling matrix, the full modal transfer matrix of the fiber. Because it's an SLM, you can also track that with time. And that's what we're looking at here. So along the x-axis, I've launched each mode of the fiber one at a time and decomposed it along the y-axis. And they've been aggregated in terms of their degenerate mode groups along that y-axis there. And you can see that if you couple into the fundamental mode, you get most of the power arriving out of the first mode group. If you couple into the LP11 mode, you get most of the power arriving out of the second mode group. Couple into 0, 2, and 2, 1, you get most of the power out of the third mode group. But as you head to higher and higher order modes, the coupling between the mode groups becomes worse and worse. And that's consistent with the impulse response, which I've shown in the previous talk, whereby as you head to higher and higher order modes, the impulse response becomes worse and worse due to modal coupling. The final bit I want to talk about is the new mode DMUX topology. In previous MDM experiments based on face masks, the modal content leaving the fiber has been split into N copies where it's tested for N modes. If you want to add more modal channels or remove modal channels, you have to physically add or remove beam splitters. And if you're working with a polarization sensitive device such as an SLM, you have to duplicate that optics for each polarization as well. This new topology works in a different manner. And I could easily explain to you how it works using this very simple 2D line drawing. And that would all be perfectly valid and scientifically justifiable. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to explain it like this. So the modal content leaving the fiber at the receiver is split into two orthogonal polarizations which are then both aligned with the polarization required of liquid crystals of the SLM. Each one of those polarizations reflects off its own phase mask before heading back through an identical set of polarizing optics, which recombines the two beams and focuses them onto the output fiber array. This is what the system looks like in practice. The beam leaving the fiber, split into two polarizations, reflects off the SLM, recombined, and then focused onto the output fiber array. The principle of operation is that the phase masks on the SLM are designed such that the correlation peaks for different modes are formed at different spatial positions, with those different spatial positions corresponding with different output fibers. So for example, if we had channel 1 propagating on the LP01 mode, you take the amplitude of that mode, combine it with a phase mask designed to detect that mode, in this case, just the phase of the mode itself, and then you tilt it in the direction of the output fiber, in this case, a tilt along the x-axis. And if the second channel is propagating on LP51, again, you take the amplitude of the mode, combine it with a phase mask designed to detect that mode, and then tilt it towards the appropriate output fiber, in this case, along the y-axis. And when you combine those two phase masks, you get something like this. And you can see how that might work just on inspection. You can see how the LP01 mode through the center of the mask is going to see a tilt along the x-axis, and the LP51 around the outside is going to see a tilt along the y-axis. Now, the actual phase masks used in practice are more complicated because they've been calculated for high modal selectivity as per the previous talk, but the principle remains the same. We can see here the LP01 mode, which is for the first channel, is being directed towards the fiber at the top right, whereas the second channel, which is propagating on a superposition of modes, is directed towards the fiber on the bottom left. And the system has several nice features. Some are a product of this new topology, and some are just a product of the reprogrammable nature of the SLM. So the new topology allows you to change how many modes you want to use, how many modal channels you want, without having to physically add or remove beam splitters. That's because the whole configuration of the system is defined by that phase mask, and that phase mask is reprogrammable. So basically, you can send any mode in either polarization to any fiber. So you can send anything anywhere. As I said, it's got other features, which aren't a product of this new topology. They're just a function of having a reprogrammable phase mask. And that means you can reprogram it to tell which modes to use, uh, which fiber each mode routes to, 
you can equalize the modal power by changing the attenuation of the phase mask, and of course you can do full modal decomposition, uh, which I've already shown in the previous slides. So finally, I'm going to perform some MDM. The transmitter is the same as the previous talk. The receiver is the new system I've just outlined. Channel 1 is a lens-launched fundamental mode. If you launch that, you might see this arriving at the receiver, and that be routed to the appropriate output fiber. The second channel is a SLM-based launch. Here I'm launching an LP12 mode, as I was in the previous talk. And if you launch that in, you might get this arriving at the receiver. The receiver will decompose that in terms of amplitude, phase, and polarization, create the relevant phase mask, and route it to the appropriate output fiber. And finally, here's some transmission tests that I've done with Ben Thompson of UCL. There are two 56 gig QPSK transmissions over two kilometers of OM2 grade fiber, the same fiber from the previous talk. And these are pure MDM, that is, there's no polarization marks to it, just the modes, and there's also no MIMO processing. I've got two examples here. One's a transmission using LP01 and LP11 on the left, and the other is a transmission using LP01 and LP12 on the right. And these two tests, we had about 12 dB of isolation for the LP11 channel and 18 dB of optical isolation for the LP12 channel. Thank you very much for listening.